Hello once again, everyone. I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett, and welcome to Across the Sky, our national Lee Enterprises weather podcast. Lee Enterprises has print and digital news operations in 77 locations across the country, including in my home base in Richmond, Virginia. Now, all of my regular colleagues are out this week, so with astronomical spring upon us, we want to take a step back and look at the big picture of spring and winter and a warming climate, go beyond the noise and examine what's really being done to lessen the impacts of the warming climate. With that, I am joined by a very special guest today, Jessica Whitehead. Jessica is Executive Director of the Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, also known as ICAR, at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Not coincidentally, Norfolk and the rest of Greater Hampton Roads is one of the most at-risk metropolitan areas in the country from sea level rise and recurring coastal flooding. Jessica earned her PhD in geography and master's in meteorology at Penn State and her bachelor's in physics from the College of Charleston. Most recently, she has worked for North Carolina Sea Grant and as the chief resilience officer for the state of North Carolina, and she is the lead author of the Northeast chapter of the upcoming 5th National Climate Assessment. I have a list of very smart people, and Jessica is always near the top of that. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sean. It's always so good to talk to you. Uh, so let's start off at the top. ICAR, for for the uninitiated, if you will. Wh- yeah. what, what, does, what do you do that there with ICAR? Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, ICAR, Old Dominion University, is an institute th- that works throughout Old Dominion University and with our partners to advance the practice of coastal resilience and adaptation. We do that by engaging with communities, organizations, and businesses to focus on developing and deploying solutions based on integrative, innovative, and applied research. Our vision at ICAR is to catalyze the action that we need to build vibrant communities, strong economies, and healthy ecosystems across the Commonwealth of Virginia, despite natural hazards and climate change. So we do that by working within the university, and we have so many partners outside who are critical to our success. So you work just beyond Hampton Roads then? Right. Um, so our our institute really is uh, unique in that we focus on the Commonwealth in particular. We do uh, work all the way up in the Middle Peninsula. We have researchers who work with us who've done work on the Eastern Shore. We have some of our researchers who in the past have reached over in not just the Chesapeake Bay watershed, but the Albemarle Pamlico watershed and doing some work down there. So um, we really are trying to build an institute that recognizes that Old Dominion University based in Norfolk, Virginia, vulnerable ourselves to sea level rise, are part of the communities in which we serve. And we have a duty to reach out, bring science to action within the communities that we're working because we're a part of those communities. And by working close to where we live, it gives us a staying power in the community. It's often very challenging when you're doing this from an academic grant kind of perspective, where you chase money, you get a grant, you get funding to go do work somewhere. You might be able to be on the ground two weeks, three weeks, four weeks during the course of that grant, and then you're gone. Uh, When we're working with these communities on really, really tough and challenging issues, as we talk about coastal resilience and sea level rise, you're going to run into us at the grocery store. You're going to run into us at church. You're going to run into us at the Civic League meeting. Uh, last night, I tried to go for a run and uh, ran into the chief of staff for the city of Norfolk and ended up having a 45-minute conversation uh, in my running clothes. So <laughs> it allows us to have that kind of a long-standing relationship, which is really, really important in a place where you are experiencing the long-term impacts of climate change. To that point, yeah, I want to talk about sea level rise first, and and obviously that lends itself to the recurring coastal flooding. When we look at at sea level rise, what are some of the things that that you are finding are still very much misunderstood about sea level rise and and the time frame and the impacts? One of the things I try to remind people, it's not just your beach house is going into the water 
right? There, it's all connected. The water in the bay is coming up. Your salinity tables are coming up. The the inland bays they're they're flooding more as well. That there's a lot more going on. What are some of the other kind of misconceptions that that you still need to kind of remind people about? Oh, there's so much more. And I'll since I think this is my first time on the podcast, I'll you know tell folks that I've built my career working in South Carolina, North Carolina. And then uh, in the course of those projects, I've had work all the way from Georgia to Maine in partnership with with other researchers, other extension specialists in my career. So I've worked in a lot of places. I think my personal favorite is always, well, sea level's not rising. I can watch out and look out the window. And you guys are listening to me right now. You can't actually see me looking out the window to the marsh across the street from my office. And, and, uh, you know, the water doesn't change very much. It's still the exact same place on that dock as it was 30 years ago. Or the other one is, well, I watch the water change three times a day or four times a day, depending on how many tides you have in that location. Um, and that's that's what the change is. And so it's not a big problem. And it's exactly what you talked about. There are so many little warning signs of sea level rise before you see the big, my dock is permanently inundated or my house is permanently inundated or my house has gone into the water. Um, You see that rising water table and that rising water table negatively affecting how well your septic systems function. That's something that's happening along North Carolina's Outer Banks, along the Middle Peninsula, Northern Neck of Virginia, uh, where you see those, those septic systems, especially in places where homeowners haven't historically been able to maintain those. That makes it even harder when you have a higher, uh, saltier water table, keeping that drain field from functioning well. Um, So that's one that happens. You can talk about habitat shift where open, you know, you think about, oh, this land is gonna be open water. You think about the blue lines on the map when you see a sea level rise map. But long before that, it's the changes in how frequently a piece of land gets flooded by salt brackish water or even by fresh water if you're far up enough in in the river. Um, in Virginia, our rivers are tidal all the way up to the fall line, which is close to I-95. Um, it's not necessarily salty that far, but you do still see changes up all the way up in King William County. And um, you have substantial changes in some cases. So you start to see marsh become open water, but you also sneakily see forests becoming marsh. And so along the Chesapeake Bay, researchers from some of our colleagues at VIMS, the Virginia Institute for Marine Science, have done recent work showing some of this conversion that for the moment, marshes are keeping up with sea level rise, but it's at the expense of losing forest land that's becoming marsh. So that habitat shift long before you see the long, the permanent loss of sea level rise. Another big challenge in Norfolk, we have historically a very, very old um, sewer system and stormwater system in some places. Um, Norfolk has been, you know, settled and resettled and um, redeveloped for hundreds of years. And some of that drainage is very, very old. There are parts of the city of Norfolk has done studies and looking at the stormwater capacity of these systems and between sea level rise, silting over time, all of those things, because it's never just the one factor, right? There are places where they sometimes lose 50% of the capacity of the stormwater system here. And that's something that happens long before we're losing houses in Norfolk. So there are just so many of these little things. Um, When you get a really, really big rain bomb, if your groundwater table is saturated because it is um, because of sea level rise and you have that higher water table, that big rain bomb is gonna take a lot longer to drain off. And it's also going to flood a lot more than it did in the past on top of being these larger slugs of rainfalls at at a time that we get with climate change. So there are so many, many other signs that aren't necessarily what you think you remember where your water line was on the dock 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that it's it's very slow day to day, but you do have to look at a lot of those natural cues to understand how long the changes are. And, you know, humans only live 80, maybe 90 years. So sometimes these things that happen, 
it's it's really hard to pick up on on a, on a short amount of time. That's when once you reach a certain age and you look back and go, you know, in my day, I remember that being different. And sometimes that's actually mm-hmm. true. Um, so it, it's kind of funny that way. Now, in addition to to sea level rise, because, I mean, you are right there in the thick of it in, in Hampton Roads. What are some of the other climate impacts you've seen uh, whether that that's heat or or heavier rainfall, what other kinds of of, of natural cues could people kind of take some time and, and look for? Yeah, another one. So thinking about you know climate impacts in particular in the southeast, I think another sneaky one that people can really relate to is you know this this winter in particular. I've had a lot of people saying oh gosh, it feels like spring came so early this year. The pollen season came so early this year. What happened with that? So I actually spent some time this morning on the Southeast Regional Climate Center's website and taking a look at some stats for Norfolk and Richmond. And apologies to those of you who are in the audience who are not in Virginia. Um, If you live in Virginia, it feels like the world is centered in Virginia. So I'm going to give you Virginia numbers. I'm sorry. Uh, But I took a look. And when you look at speaking of things that are subtle, we often think climate change. We want to see record high temperatures every year. And that should mean that every year is hotter than the last. What is that? Sometimes it's a lot sneakier. When you look at the stats for Norfolk's winter, it wasn't a particularly, you know, it wasn't like a top, you know, warmth winter, you know, t- you know, top five warm winters in terms of, um, you know, their, their maximum temperatures and record set and all of those things. Where we got really sneaky this winter is the number of days and the average temperatures that we had below or that were above freezing. So our ecological systems here are adapted to freeze. Um, They're expecting to freeze a certain number of, of days per year. If we are suddenly having a winter where we don't have as many days where we get below freezing, or when the average temperature overall is not necessarily the warmest, but it's kind of, it's warmer than average often enough to bump that average up, you get winters like we had here. So um, the last three months, and we're recording this on St. Patrick's Day, so 17th of March. Um, So the last three months, going back to uh, December 16th in Norfolk, we are tied for the fourth, um, fourth number, Number, ugh, trying to figure out how to explain this. Uh, number of days per year where our minimum temperature stayed over freezing. So, um, you know, this year it was, um, you know, 69 days where that minimum temperature was staying over freezing. So we had a l- larger number of days than normal where we didn't get that freeze during the year. Um, We also had uh, pretty long streaks of days where we didn't see temperatures below freezing here compared to normal. Um, So tied for number four on record there. And, you know, some of the other years that we see these really long, you know, streaks of where that minimum temperature stayed above freezing, we didn't send those signals to the plants and to the animals. Um, You know, those are those years that we're thinking of as being really warm on record. So 2019, 2020, 2011, 2012, 97, 98. Um, it's kind of those years sticking out. Um, so what we see, and we actually had in, um, I'd looked for some numbers in Richmond too. In Richmond, you also see, saw a lot of these days where that minimum temperature didn't get below freezing. There was actually a 14-day streak in um, late February, early March, where you didn't you didn't have a freeze at all. And um, all of these are sending signals to the plants and the animals that we have. Hey, it's warm enough to wake up. And next thing you know, you're you're doing the flonase a lot earlier than you have to do. You all of a sudden you see the pine explosion on your car. I came out this morning. My car is yellow already, and it's only the beginning of March. You know, you think so. You begin to see the the plants and the animals respond. And again, it's not necessarily to these huge record temperatures. It's to the slow creep over time of not having those freeze signals as often uh, that you begin to to force this shift. Um, The concerns as you go forward then are what does it mean for these plants and animals? You know, we know 
you, you and I are, are meteorologists by training. We know it's March, it's April, it's Virginia. We're still going to get a freeze. We're still going to get a cold snap. Right now, our fruit trees are already in bloom. Uh, the cherry blossoms in D.C. are going to be peaking within the next week or so. Uh, so what now happens when you already have those blooms out, you already have fruit starting to set, and you go in and you have a freeze? Um, that's going to be potentially devastating for our farmers when we know that that's going to happen. So there are, it's not just, you know, the critters for the sake of the critters, although I do love me some critters, but it's, you know, this economic impact from what we expect to do in terms of, you know, fish who are, you know, historically important fishing industries here, the tribes within Virginia who historically rely on shad runs as culturally and um, you know, sig you know, financially significant for them, um, and these changes that we have for Virginia's farmers, those have real impacts and real dollars, and you'll see it when you go to the grocery store. For sure, you know, one of the other things when we talk about the data that I, that I try to to remind people of, and exactly to your point, you know, big heat gets headlines. For sure. Mm -hmm. But when it doesn't get cold, that doesn't make as much noise, right? I mean, I had to look back as as well. We only we just had back to back nights with a freeze here in Richmond this week for the first time since February. Right. Um, you know, and, and we very rarely have gotten below 20, 26, 27 degrees. What you know, we would classify as a hard freeze. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get to 31 degrees for an hour or so, and that doesn't do a whole lot. But if you get, but you've got to get down into the twenties for a few hours. That's when that's when it starts to hit the proverbial fan, uh, as mm -hmm. it were. So these are the things that that we have to think about going forward. Because as you said, I think people see the movie the day after tomorrow and think, well, it's all going to happen in a week. I'm like, no, man, it, it doesn't happen that way. It's very slow, methodical, and just kind of marches in on you day after day after day slowly and methodically until sooner or later that tide doesn't go away for good anymore you know mm -hmm. it comes up maybe hey it used to flood here once every year and then it's once every six months and it's once every couple of months then like oh now it's here all the time mm -hmm. and i think those those are the things that are that are tough to convey uh, but are clearly clearly going on uh, I want to take a little bit of a break, then we'll, I want to come back, talk a little bit about the, the academic side here and a little sure. bit about the, the National Climate Assessment. So stay with us. We'll be right back with more from Jessica Whitehead on the Across the Sky podcast. Michael J. for Hope for the Warriors. Started back in 06 at Camp Lejeune. Military families witnessing the effects of war on their loved ones. Now, almost 20 years later, they've aided over 53,000 service members, veterans, and families with confidential, high-quality behavioral health care services at little or no cost to post-9-11 vets and their families. Over 91% of every dollar donated goes directly to the programs. If you're as concerned about our heroes as I am, go to hopeforthewarriors.org. And welcome back to the Across the Sky podcast. I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett in Richmond, Virginia, talking with my, my good friend and brilliant scientist, Jessica Whitehead uh, at Old Dominion University in Norfolk. Uh, Jessica, I want to talk a little bit about about your path here because you know you do have your phd but you're not in the in the classic academic setting i mean yes you're in a, you're in an academic setting at odu but you're not like yes. you know distinguished professor of such and such and such talk a little bit about how how you got to to this position in your career and then how that that folds in uh to your role with the national climate assessment sure so uh my first climate communication experience and it, it was more of a weather communication experience um emergency management kind of thing was when i was 11 years old and hurricane hugo was hitting my hometown of charleston south carolina and my mom and i were temporarily living in southern illinois at the time because she had to do the on-campus portion of her master's degree and so i fell in love with the idea my my mom, our, our friends were all still there. 
some of them had not evacuated. They they needed information. The power was out. So we had the corded phones because I'm that old. And uh, my mom plopped me in front of this newfangled thing called the Weather Channel on cable TV and said, tell me what's happening because the phone cord didn't reach all the way to where the TV was. And um, uh, that was the first night where I tried to learn how to take what I was uh, getting in and tell them what they needed to know as their power was out. And we kept on like that until midnight when the phone went dead. And they, they were all fine. There was a lot of damage to our neighborhood. That's another story. But that experience stayed with me. And I loved math and science. Um, you know, it was the, the early 90s. So once I realized that you could actually be a woman and don't take this the wrong way, I didn't want to do meteorology on TV, not my thing. Absolutely nothing against those of you who do. It just was, I, I wanted to go out and chase tornadoes. Um, and that was even before Twister came out. Uh, and, um, so I really pathed myself to go into hardcore meteorology. And when I got there, it began to feel like it wasn't going to be a fit for me because, you know, the expectation is that you're sitting there doing coding and partial differential equations and all of that for 16 hours a day to go out and do this stuff. And that just, I was always more of a people person. And it was, I was taking a class on climate change uh, with Greg Jenkins at Penn State. You and I are both Penn Staters. And there, something came up in class where we were talking about, well, why can't you just cut off all of the coal emissions? And so other people in my class were very confused. And I turned around and launched into an entire science policy <laughs> lecture with the fellow student about, you know, well, what are we going to do for job retraining? What are we going to do to replace this industry? You're never going to be able to convince people in the science alone if you're not also coming up with solutions that backfills this industry that creates, you know, that is, you know, props up entire state governments. And Dr. Jenkins pulled me aside afterward and he said, you know, if somebody's going to figure out uh, the math that leads to a better tornado warning or a cloud parameterization scheme and a model, the math is going to be there. Somebody's going to find it. Not everybody gets the people piece. And maybe you should think about that. And I did. And I ended up switching between my master's and my PhD to geography, where I could do work in climate adaptation. And very specifically, I did a lot of work at the local level on trying to help people make different decisions who were in vulnerable positions. In that case, it was small rural drinking water systems in central Pennsylvania. And I loved that part of my dissertation so much. The idea, not that I got a publication out of anything, but that I was able to do this work with them in a way that they understood and fired their accountant and <laughs> um, decided that maybe they needed to install water meters because of this work that we were doing to try to, to understand and model how their drinking water supply changes with drought and with abnormally you know, wet periods and floods that I thought maybe this traditional faculty thing isn't for me. So a job opened up with this pilot climate extension specialist with the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium, North Carolina Sea Grant, and the Carolinas Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center at U U University of South Carolina, which was a NOAA-funded program at the time. And I applied for it, and I took it. And it took me back home to Charleston. And um, it was a great experience. And I thought that I was just going to do it for a couple of years, and it ended up becoming my whole career. Um, that was those skills of how do you take the information and get it to where people can a, understand it, and B, use it in the decisions that they're making, whether we're talking about community planning or transportation planning or disaster recovery, was exactly the kind of skill set that was needed when North Carolina created its chief resilience officer position. So I, en I ended up there a um, little shy of two years in a position where I was based with North Carolina Emergency Management and in the Office of Recovery and Resiliency when those two were, were still together. Um, and 
where I was meeting with the governor once a week and briefing out on the resilience progress that the state was making. So when I came to ODU, I was really pleasantly surprised that those were the skills that they were looking for in setting up ICAR. They were very deliberately not looking for someone who was preeminent scientist. Um, they wanted someone who understood that all of these ideas that you have about how to do buyouts or relocations are really, really great. But here's the legal issues that you have with property rights. And here's how the problems that you have with setting that up and funding. And here's how the federal programs are eligible or not eligible for that. Because those quite often are the barriers to getting things done, not the understanding of the science. It's understanding how you can create a program around regulations that exist or how those regulations and policies need to change to make progress. And that's really what ICAR is, is um, charged with doing. So often I find myself saying the devil is in the details way more than, than I ever had before, because, you know, mm -hmm. to the macro level, it, it seems kind of obvious what to do, but then to your point, getting down into the nitty gritty of, okay, well, how are we going to make this happen? What kind of constraints are we already under? What are the boundary conditions to steal a, to steal a term from, from mathematical modeling yep. uh, to, to make these things happen uh, so that everybody can thrive. Now, now with that, we, we talk about impacts, of course, uh, and you're one of the chapter authors of the upcoming yes. national climate assessment. Yes, um, I am. So, Let's talk a little bit about that. We call it NCA for short. This is not something that's brand new. This thing kind of comes out periodically. So, so talk us through uh, the NCA and and what it means to be a, a chapter author, a lead chapter author. I think probably most people in this space have heard of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And they produce these big international reports that are these big consensus reports. And they're very, very closely negotiated with parties and scientists from all over the globe. And they're very authoritatively cited. The U.S. Global Change Research Program is the federal entity that was created from um, with membership from all of the relevant fe federal agencies that coordinates producing the United States report. And there are, we're, we're currently working on the fifth one. They're supposed to be done every five years, four years, five years. Uh, that hasn't exactly happened in the past. There were, were several gaps in the, the 2000s between reports, uh, but there's a good system in place now with, with USGCRP funded and federally supported to produce these assessments every four years. Um, and it is a tremendous undertaking uh, where you have federal leads who are um, tasked to each chapter, who are your federal agency liaisons, and then you also have non-federal leads. And those folks are in charge of pulling together the author team from um, science, from practice, trying to make sure that they're geographically balanced, uh, demographically balanced, that you know, all of these diverse perspectives are included um, to pull together the author teams to make this happen. The National Climate Assessment is arranged and it has uh, sector chapters, so focused on energy, or the um, you know status of climate science or adaptation overall the coasts there are all of these chapters and then there are also regional chapters so the northeast is a region uh, oddly I'm I'm sitting in Norfolk Virginia Norfolk is Virginia is actually in the southeast but uh, the the southeast region stretches from Virginia to Florida and then all the way to Louisiana. Uh, the Northeast region goes Maryland and D.C., northward all the way to Maine, and all the way inland to Pennsylvania and West Virginia. If you think about geography then and watersheds, uh, watersheds have their own boundaries, which means the Chesapeake Bay gets split. So in my case, moving up to Norfolk, because we are this coastal institute, uh, and I've done work, a couple of my projects in the past have been in Maryland, have been in Maine. Um, 
they pulled me in because often the Ch the Chesapeake Bay kind of informally gets pulled into the Northeast chapter. Otherwise, it would get split between the two and nobody would cover it. So it's it's not written down anywhere, but it is sort of a, an informal agreement that we make sure that we cover Chesapeake Bay issues in the Northeast chapter. And so, so that's why I'm there. Uh, we've got a great team of authors. Uh, as we're recording this in, in March, we've just finished the public comment period. So unfortunately, I can't talk to you a whole lot about my chapter because we're back under embargo again. Um, but it is an excellent resource. And we're currently running on track to be able to release MCA5 sometime in the late fall to the public. We've got another couple of drafts in responding to the public comments where we respond to every one of the public comments received. Uh, we've also just received our uh, comments from the National Academy of Sciences. And so we'll also respond to every one of those comments received. So um, it's an exciting time. Um, I, I'm really happy with how these chapters are coming together. But it really is intended to be the assessment for the nation. Um, where are we? What's happened since the last one? What are the big updates in um, what we're seeing? And how do we provide that information back to the public um, with a whole lot of a more emphasis on making sure that the NCA is not just something that's read by scientists and graduate students, but that the text is geared toward anyone who can read it, uh, decision makers, elected officials, business owners, you know, corporations, all of these entities could also be users of the National Climate Assessment. And a lot, a lot of the big focus with the authors now is improving that accessibility. Yeah, to to that point, I don't want you to give away anything that you that you can't give away. But the the last one, NCA four, came out in two phases. It was the uh, the climate science special report, and then the impacts. Uh, can you say if it's coming out all at once, or is it going to be kind of broken into pieces again? Yeah, this time it is all at once. Okay. Um, and I, I think I can say that because that that was um, the the public drafts that were uh, out for public comment. You you can kind of go back and and see that that was. That was the way it was done. So it should all be out at once. All right. Wonderful. Is there anything else you want, want to share? Any, any other cool nuggets or anything like that about, about the work that's being done there uh, that uh, at ICAR? I'm actually really excited to have a chance to, to announce and plug. Uh, we, we just went public with it this week. We have a brand new partnership with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in Virginia. Uh, last year in Virginia's uh, General Assembly, ICAR received an appropriation. Uh, it was something that was put in by uh, Delegate Barry Knight, uh, Senator George Barker. So something that was bipartisan and also geographically diverse within Virginia to charge ICAR in its partnership with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, why do this? As we look forward to thinking about how we respond to climate change and sea level rise, there are there's a real risk that many of the adaptations we might put into place could come at the expense of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, it's very important here because the Chesapeake Bay does actually have standards that we have to meet. You know, there are Chesapeake Bay rules and there's a whole Chesapeake Bay Commission that meets, you know, makes sure that we're meeting the federal requirements to improve the water quality of that watershed. It's a multi-state agreement, multi-state concern, multi-state challenge. Um, Virginia's General Assembly obviously only has uh, jurisdiction over the part of this that we can control in Virginia. But as we look forward, we don't want to create situations where we are, say, putting up a whole bunch of big gray walls to protect people and doing that at the expense of ecosystems. Um, we don't want to lose our marshes. We don't want to lose our healthy forests. We certainly don't want to lose the industries that depend on those things like fishing and farming and all of these other pieces that are so important to Virginia's economy. So we are really charged with taking the science to action. And in this new partnership, we'll be bringing in some additional technical capacity to work with localities throughout Virginia. We're hiring a program manager and four research faculty here at ICAR. They'll focus on areas that we know we have gaps where um, our localities don't have enough people to do this. A lot of them do have their own people and they're able to make some really great progress. Um, some of, even some of those who are making great progress and are known for adaptation 
uh, innovative adaptation projects don't necessarily have the people in the capacity to keep pushing the envelope to figure out what the next step is. So providing that technical capacity, providing that innovation in geospatial analysis, uh, resilient engineering and design with a focus on the use of natural and nature-based features, uh, economics, so making sure that we're not just valuing property values because we know that there are so many communities in Virginia and throughout the country that have been historically overburdened and undervalued, and that comes through in the property values. You know, we're talking about communities that have been historically redlined, but there are things that need to be valued like equity, like the value of natural and nature-based features and preserving those functions. So somebody in economics who can focus on bringing that capacity into Virginia, and then someone who focuses on resilient planning and integration. So if you create a resilience plan, does it actually talk to any of the other plans that actually that make a locality tick? Does it talk to your economic development strategy? Does it talk to your comprehensive plan? Does it talk to your parks and recreation plan? All of those other things. Um, so somebody who specializes in that. And then we're also looking at doing a study of workforce development. And in particular, we're thinking of that very, very broadly because there are people out there right now who are thinking about how to capture the federal adaptation dollars that are coming out of the Infrastructure Act and the um, IAJA, the, the, um, the, the Jobs Act. And a lot of that money is aimed at projects that can improve resilience and reduce risk in this flood resilient space, coastal resilient space, climate resilient space. Um, we know that there are people right now who they're going to have to do that as a part of their jobs and they don't necessarily have those skills in place. But then we also know that as we think forward to managing this, you know, a lot of times when we step climate models out, we look at, you know, 2050. Those people who are going to be middle of their careers making decisions about dealing with risk in 2050 are sitting in our elementary and middle school classrooms right now. So what degree programs as a university do we need to be building so that once they graduate from high school, once they track into, you know, 2030, you know, they're 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 in college, they're working toward being able to be the professionals managing these things. What skills do we need to provide them as a part of those degrees and how do we do it? Um, so understanding what's already being done in Virginia and elsewhere, and then making sure that ODU can step in and fill that gap, whether it's credentialing for today's professionals who are trying to capture today's dollars, or your more traditional degree programs for your students who are entering college, you know, in the next three to four years, all the way out to the next 20. So uh, between those are two big focuses of what we're doing with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. At the same time, we're also supporting the Commonwealth of Virginia as it works on establishing what its resilience infrastructure needs to be within the government. Um, a lot of people don't think about how important governmental coordination is to being able to make progress. You, know, you have resilience things that are being done in your Department of Emergency Management and your Department of Transportation and your Department of Conservation and Recreation. And how, how are you organizing that? How are you making it a comprehensive strategy? So there's a, a statewide resilience working group that's been launched. Uh, we've provided some of the funds to have uh, VCU's Wilder School be an external facilitator for that and continuing to bring our expertise along with the expertise of many other universities to the table in that process. Um, and we continue to work to help Virginia support the Commonwealth's uh, Coastal Resilience Master Plan too. So, um, you know, there's going to be big outreach efforts on, on that as they have updates coming out. And so working toward and working with DCR on how we support those things. So this is a pretty big investment for a university system. It's $1.5 million per year. So uh, really excited to be doing this in partnership with Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And it's such a, such important work. We have so much coastline here in Virginia. As you said, we have the the tidal rivers. We have the marsh. You know, we have the, you know the Rappahannock, the Potomac, the, the the James, the York, the whole Chesapeake, and all that. Uh, there is a lot of land at risk, and we need to manage it the best that we can. Jessica, thank you. 
so much for for taking the time with us this afternoon. Uh, where could be people go online to find out more about uh, ICAR and, and their work? We are at oduicar.org. That's the the shorter version. Uh, you can also find us at oduadaptationresilience.org, but it's just easier to use the the shorter alias to um, to oduicar.org and check us out online. Um, as we're we're booting up, we're going to be updating that website more often, and we're also looking into establishing some social media channels, which we don't currently have. <laughs> um, that said, if you really want to find me on Twitter, which I haven't been doing a whole lot of lately, because I think you can figure out I'm busy with a whole lot of other things, you can also find me on Twitter at Dr. Jess Whitehead. Awesome. All right, Jess, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Good luck with everything, getting the people on board that, that need to come on board to get the work done. Stay with us. We'll be right back with a few closing thoughts on our Across the Sky podcast. August 31st. Little baby present. It's only us. Made it out the trenches this time. At Capital One Arena. Get ready for an epic summer. Little Baby's IOU Tour has finally <laughs> touched down. It's Lil Baby live in concert featuring the King LaRoy, Glow Brilla, Rilo Rodriguez, and Honcho. Tickets are on sale now at Ticketmaster.com. Brought to you by Mammoth Live and AG Touring. And welcome back, everyone, to the Across the Sky podcast. I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett, and the rest of our meteorologists are out this week. Special thanks to Jessica Whitehead from ODU to spending time with us uh, for this particular version of the podcast, talking about climate and resilience. It is a long, long-term uh, battle, a long-term project uh, to be ready for a changing climate, to adapt and to mitigate uh, what's going to be happening in Virginia and beyond the warming climate and uh, and rising seas. So when we come back next week, we'll do something a little more fun. The rest of the gang will be back, and we're going to be talking with Liz Lightman from the Storm Prediction Center. She had a lot of a lot of good press in the last three or four weeks or so, as being the first woman to issue a national to issue a uh, a severe weather uh, watch from the Storm Prediction Center. Uh, and both Joe Martucci and I were surprised that it took that long, but she's going to talk about why, and it, and it might surprise you as, as to why it happened the way it did. So that'll, they'll be joining us next week on the Across the Sky podcast. But for the rest of the team that's out this week, I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett from the Richmond Times-Dispatch. We'll see you next time. August 31st. Little baby present. It's only us. Made it out the trenches this time. At Capital One Arena. Get ready for an epic summer. Little Baby's IOU Tour has finally <laughs> touched down. It's Lil Baby live in concert featuring the King LaRoy, Glow Brilla, Rilo Rodriguez, and Honcho. Tickets are on sale now at Ticketmaster.com. Brought to you by Mammoth Live and AG Touring.